Hello Budapest. Hello world. It's been a while. I've been gone for a couple of weeks, uh, doing lots of grading and report writing and parent-teacher conferences and all that fun stuff that goes along with the end of the year when you're a school teacher. <sighs> so now after a long breath, I finally managed to put together the episode I recorded a few weeks ago with a delightful young woman by the name of Heather Keegan. She is, like me, an expatriate who has found herself living in the beautiful city of Budapest, Hungary. And this is the start of a, hopefully a long series of interviews, uh, maybe monthly, the goal is monthly, uh, where I'll interview people from all different backgrounds that come from all different places in the world and, uh, and share our stories about living in this city of ours. Uh, Heather is from Canada, so she brings kind of an interesting perspective on things. She's got a great sense of humor. You can hear that in the conversation. We cover a lot of territory, and I'm sure that you're going to enjoy it. So sit back, get yourself a, you know, a wine, a whiskey, a potinka, whatever your jam is. Light up a blunt. Whatever it is, do it. Kick back, relax, and enjoy our wide-ranging conversation. Um, first of all, um, thank you for joining me. Um, this is part of what I hope will become a, somewhat of a tradition for this podcast, which is interviewing others who have found themselves living in Budapest for a myriad reasons that we all do. Um, and so my guest today is uh, Heather Keegan. Did I pronounce that right? Keegan or Kagan? <laughs> Keegan, yep, you're right. Keegan, good. all right, excellent. Um, and uh, so why don't you tell a little, us a little bit about how you ended up in Budapest? Like, what's your expat story, if you will? Oh, geez. Um, okay, <laughs> cool. All right, it's a little bit long, maybe. Um, so this is my second time, time in Budapest. Cool, all right. So my second time in Budapest. Um, I lived here, I think, about seven or eight years ago now. I keep saying six. But I get those, um, your memories on Facebook nonsense. <laughs> so it's, it's actually been yeah. significantly longer than, than six, I think. Oh. I, think it's, I think it's been about eight. Oh, um, all right. Yeah, surprisingly, right? Um, so I came here initially about eight years ago, I guess, to do my CELTA, to do my first kind of teaching certification course with IH. So for um, those who don't know, what, uh, yeah. tell us what that cer teaching certification is and also what IH is. Sure. Um, so if you want to teach in the TEFL industry, um, oftentimes you'll get some kind of certification. So it's right. kind of like a basic teaching course. It lasts about a month, if I remember correctly. Um, and you do like you do some teaching practice. You learn how to communicate grammar. You learn ways of getting people to participate in class. Um, mm -hmm. You do a little bit of grammar research, student research. I think I had three assignments I had to do at the same time and then I'm like assessed on all of my teaching and the assignments and everything like that. Um, and it's it's originally certified by Cambridge. So oh, okay. there are centers all over the world where you can do it. Um, Budapest at the time happened to be the closest and the cheapest and the best reviewed. Um, it was a choice between uh, Budapest or Krakow for me. Oh. Um, Oh, what excited. an interesting choice to have to make <laughs> in the moment. <laughs> it, was, it was a great, it was a really cool choice. I really liked it at the time. Um, so I decided to come here. Mm -hmm. um, and IH is International House. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, right. right. They're a, like a, a teaching center here. So yeah. they also do a lot of uh, professional development for teachers. So they run um, the, the next level up after you have a CELTA, which would be the first course, is a DELTA. Um, and for people in the UK, it's equivalent to like a level seven, which is like, I think of it as like a baby masters, but I think it's a little bit stronger than that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can take like, you can do it intensively over nine months, I think, or you can take up to two years to complete it. Um, so they're pretty, IH runs a lot of, um, teacher training stuff. 
Um, so they're pretty they're pretty up on those kind I mean, of things. That sounds so. like a pretty like pretty much a master's to me. I mean, most <laughs> masters take a year and a half, two years. Yeah, right? I, I don't know. I don't know if it's... I mean, I didn't have to do a dissert... Like, you don't have to do a dissertation or anything like oh, that. Oh, so it's like there's... minus... Like a master's minus, like having to do a thesis kind of thing. Yeah, right. kind yeah, of. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Um, I, at the moment, I'm doing not the Delta, but the same thing as a Delta, but from Trinity College of London. Uh-huh. Um, it's called a dip TESOL, um, but it's the same. So it's a level seven um, qualification. Uh, okay. I've got... I had a teaching practical element that I had to pass. I had to do a pronunciation and phonology exam, which was Ooh. really stressful. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was good. It was good fun. Um, <laughs> and then there's like a, a language awareness exam, which talks about like grammar and do you know what grammar is and how to teach it. And then there are three papers you have to complete. So I'm on my last paper at the moment and then I'll be done. All right. Yeah. Excellent. So that's your edge. That's your what you're teaching is English. Sounds like yes. English yeah. as a foreign language or English as a second language or or mm-hmm. EAL as it often is here. English is an additional language, right? Because yeah. many of them are more than speak more than just Hungarian, and they often speak Hungarian and German. Uh, I guess the most common would be German, right? I have a lot of yeah, a lot of students who've studied German. A couple have studied French, but yeah, the bulk of mine, if they've got another language, is is uh is german you're right yeah yeah it's great so so tell us now now jump back in and tell us a little bit more about how you ended up here how'd you end right. up in budapest right so um i stayed for a year when i was here before and then once around did some traveling um i taught in south korea for a couple of years oh, yeah. um took a year off and bummed around southeast asia Um, Spent some time in the UK and then went to Sri Lanka for just about three years to teach. And um, I was kind of, I had kind of had enough of Sri Lanka. Um, I had a positive experience there, like I enjoyed my time there. But um, I was there for about two and a half years and I was ready for something different. Uh Um, And a position opened up, a full-time position opened up here in Budapest. And I thought, it's been so long. It's a different city now. I'm sure it's a different city yeah. than what it was before. Yeah. And it'd Things be have really nice. changed a lot here over the last 15 so years. So much. Yeah, yeah. So, so much. <laughs> like, it really, it took me aback when I first got here. Like, I couldn't get over the grotty areas that I was used to that were a little bit more run down, a little more ramshackle. All of a sudden, yeah. they were really hip. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, where am I supposed to go for cheap booze? What, how am I supposed to go out <laughs> drinking yeah. now? The beer but, is still cheap, but, yeah. but getting getting like a you know a shot or something is not as cheap as it once used to be. No, <laughs> not even not even kind of. So it's like yeah. okay, I gotta really up my budget, I guess, if I'm, I'm still <laughs> yeah. planning on on nights out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, um, so a position opened up, and I figured, why not see see what it's like again? Let's get back to to Europe. I've got a lot of friends um, that are in Europe. Uh, at the moment, so it would be easier for me to see them. Had a couple of weddings coming up, wanted to go to those. I've got mm-hmm. family in Scotland, so it just kind of made sense to come back. So you've been here, like, continuously now for how many uh, years, roughly, now? No, not even. I arrived in um, I arrived in August, end of August, so I've been here for almost, no, what, like nine months, I guess? Long enough to have had just over enough time oh. to have a baby, I think, is how I've equated right. it in my head. Right. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so you you've been here so not not that much less than I have actually. I mean, I like you. I came back and forth multiple times. I actually met my wife here in oh, cool. uh, two thousand one, um, and and we lived uh, when we got engaged she came with me to the united states and we mm-hmm. lived in the united states for way longer than we had planned to um, <laughs> cuz my goal was actually to get a job teaching english at uh, what was then uh, britannica international school oh and, yeah okay uh, and i was offered a job but i needed to finish my ba in order okay. to take the job so i was like all right i'll go back to the states i'll finish my the last few units of my my bachelor's degree in music and Mm -hmm. come back after that when i got there i said screw it and i changed my major and got old and i found my inner nerd and you know 15 years later i'm a phd candidate and my wife has got her bachelor's and master's degree so we all just we kind of 
fell into that mode of things once we got into the United States and we just got used to being there again. And um, for her, it was new and interesting. For me, it was returning to what I knew. Mm. And uh, so 15 years later, we we finally made the move back. And so we arrived here with my son, Oliver, who's five. Aww. Awesomest little dude ever. Cool. Um, and we uh, arrived here in April... April 3rd, actually, of, of 19. So, okay. um, so yeah, so we've been here just over a year and, uh, yeah, after being gone for a long time and boy, yeah, boy, did it change. How is, how is your little dude dealing with it? How's he, you know, what does he think about it? You know, like all five-year-olds, he's really resilient, you know, yeah, he, he handles it well. There are days when he really misses, cause the interesting thing for him, right, is that, the house we were living in, which was in Washington, upstate Washington, just south mm-hmm. of the border um, of Canada, actually. We lived in, in Bellingham. I don't know if you ever went down that side of Canada much. but uh... Uh, Not a whole lot, but the, the area is kind of familiar. I had friends from around there that uh, I met at university, so uh-huh. kind of. Uh-huh. I, I, know, I know roughly what, where you mean. Yeah, so it's just like right below Vancouver. We live a 20-minute car drive. You're in Vancouver, or you're okay. across the border anyway. Um, yeah, so we lived there, and it was very beautiful, and we had this, we lived in this apartment complex that had like a duck pond in the backyard. Aww. It was amazing, <laughs> and so he calls it the ducky house, <laughs> and it's heartbreaking because every once in a while he goes, I miss the ducky house, and oh. like, you know, and he tears up a little bit. So that's the only thing that he struggles with is that yeah. the first place that he can remember living was the last place we were, which was... <laughs> in washington so so he's emotional about that but otherwise he's really adjusted well and because his mama has always been speaking uh hungarian to him you know he's he's bilingual so he's always grown up with both languages in the house and so he understands everything everybody says to him in hungarian he still kind of refuses to speak hungarian but uh, (laughs) you know he's like i speak english only english you know but but he's getting more curious about it and stuff it's pretty fascinating to watch him pick it up the way he does i feel like that's quite normal like i i taught at a a kindergarten sort of daycare place in uh ukraine before coming to um before coming to budapest to do my salsa um and i had There was a little girl, I think she was about four, four or five, maybe Uh four-ish. And her dad was Turkish. Her mom Uh was Ukrainian. And she understood her dad. Like, no problems. Dad had always spoken to her in Turkish. No bothers. But she refused to speak it. She was like, nope. (laughs) I'm having none of this. This is not happening. They're pretty Um, stubborn at that age, too. Once they decide something, they're just, that's where they're at. That's where they're at. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I think think the change will come, right? Like, at some point. That's, That's sweet. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been it's that part's been nice, yeah. So so you you mentioned uh, and as, as have I how things have changed. What did what did you what did you notice? Like what did you uh, what were some of the things that kind of caught your like caught your eye from when you had been here before and that had that initial you know interaction with Budapest and then coming back like what uh, what changed for you? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the first thing I noticed kind of driving in from the airport was how much bigger it seemed to have gotten. So, like, Mm. it seemed to really have kind of sprawled out a bit more. And then just polish. Everything seemed really, really nice, you know, like super clean, I suppose, in a way. And kind of the... Like cell common tear, right? Yeah. Like like that used to be Moskva tear for those who those of us those who don't know what we're talking about and boy it used to be really funky it used to be it really did. cool and funky actually <laughs> yeah i used to go i remember i used to have there used to be like a bar just above uh, yes. kind of where the metro was and yes that's gone what i love that? that place i used to it go was... and sit up there and write in my journal it was like a great like you, you feel like you're in the middle of the universe like all these yeah. people traveling from different places and just everybody hanging out there and you could see the whole square from there i was so bummed when i first went there and i was like where's what happened here why is it all nice why is it like a like a park now you know like what happened you know (laughs) so strange so strange and i think the weirdest thing for me is like 
you still kind of have the same people that would be coming there that I would have seen, you know, six, seven years ago. It's not uh -huh. like the same people traveling have changed. Like people are still using that as a main thoroughfare. Sure, right? so sure. Yeah. You still like it's all polished and shiny and kind of like new age kind of style. But then you've yeah. still got, you know, you've still got the Hare Krishnas that are wandering around <laughs> asking you if you're up for if you're up for some religion. You've yeah. still got buskers. You've still got, yep. you know, people bumming. So it's it's really I don't know there's there's a real discord there with that I find it's, yeah it's, it's really bizarre. interesting how that's that's changed so much yeah yeah parts Definitely. of me like it you know you know what well, I used to like there is I like the being an American um, especially being you know a U.S. American which we'll come back to that by the way mm -hmm. uh, but being a U.S. American it, and it's everything of course already everything here is so old comparatively yeah. speaking to anything that I ever see and so you know, as an American and when I used to go to Moscow in the early 90s I mean in the early 2000s mm -hmm. and I would there was that little funky um you might remember this little coffee kiosk that was sort of like right in the middle of the square yeah and I think so all these like yeah. old dudes would like you know stand <laughs> around the around the outside and you would there was nowhere to sit you just kind of stood there and drank yeah. your espresso and the espressos were literally like 50 florins yeah i think at cheap. one point they were even less than 50 florins it was like 50 florins for a double or something and then or it was a 75 florins for a double i think and uh and i used to love that place that it like made me feel like i could connect yeah with some old part of hungary that i could never understand uh, mm -hmm. being who I was but I could get a feel for yeah you know? I know what you mean yeah. kind of like a window into being a local where yeah it didn't necessarily matter that you weren't for yeah. like a brief moment in time you were accepted and you could just yeah you could be a part of that yeah yeah definitely yeah and and now when they go and I live actually right by cell commentary I don't know what neighborhood you live in but we live really close we're on Fila Rutsa, which okay, is yeah. like uh, you know, you can almost spit on Cell Common from here. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, it's a great neighborhood. And, uh, and yeah, so it's like I don't – and with between that and the Mahmood Mall and, the, mm -hmm. you know, all the, you know, the McDonald's and the KFC and all this stuff, and as a U.S. American, I'm constantly reminded of America. Yeah. Which is a little bit annoying. Like it didn't feel that way in the, in the early 2000s. And I think most of the older Hungarians, they like, they see it as progress, right? Yeah, sure. But I, or sp maybe more the younger Hungarians actually, but I, I so uh, there's a part of me that's like, uh, maybe kind of curmudgeonly or whatever. I, <laughs> like, I want the, like, I feel like we lost something when, yeah. uh, with these, some of these kind of changes. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I, I agree. I don't know. There was, for me, like, I remember going to work for the first day and stopping at a, I think it was My Little Melbourne for coffee, uh -huh. which is a, a super cute coffee shop kind of near uh, Deac France Terre. And uh -huh. um, stopping in and it was like, okay, well, I'll have a flat white. I can have a flat white, right? Yeah, sure. We can do flat whites. No problem. It's like, all right, nice. Okay, I like this. Um, so that's like 900 forint. And I was just like, no, no, surely you're mistaken. <laughs> Why on earth is coffee this expensive? Yeah, that really changed. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Yeah, that really that kicked me pretty hard. And it was it was okay. Got to rein yeah. this in. Got to start. Yeah. Got to start brewing for Special home. Special coffee home. is three trips on the tram. You know, it's oh, like it's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah. Really nuts. Yeah. And the Starbucks everywhere. And so I have mm -hmm. to admit, I never go to Starbucks when I lived in when I lived in in Seattle. You know, I would avoid <laughs> Starbucks like the plague, right? But when I came here. I was like, oh my god, I can get a tall coffee, like just a regular drip coffee. It's like, yeah. it's so that's the only reason I go to Starbucks because I every once in a while I just want to get a big giant coffee and sip on it for two hours, like we do in the United States. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Hungarians look at you like you're my my mother in law always looks at me like I'm from Mars when I have like a big huge cup of coffee. <laughs> It's I like, remember... it's not all espresso, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I promise, I promise. It's not all, like, quadruple. <laughs> yeah. I had to go out to uh, Rakosh Pilata, 
um, to pick up a package. Um, uh -huh. And I, I felt like I was in an entirely different universe. It felt like nothing even remotely close to Budapest. Wow. But I found the best 250 foreign coffee I have had since arriving. Really? And I won't go all the way out there to get it again, but should <laughs> I be there? Definitely, definitely happen again. It's good to know where those little nooks and crannies are, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it sounds like you, so part of your story is you ended up here in Budapest, um, for some training as an English teacher mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and did a little teaching here. Right. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. also went uh, and then went other places to teach. Mm -hmm. As a story with so many English, um, for those of you out there who have who have maybe considered teaching English as a foreign language or an additional language, one of the great things that comes with that is you can travel all over the world. So, if I remember, I, I don't know if you can talk about it or not, but you you work at the uh, at the um, what was it the. British. British Council. Yeah, the British Council. Um, they have some offices that are maybe just exam centers. Um, like in Austria, I think they have just an exam center, but I might be wrong about that. Um, okay. Or they run kind of IELTS exams or Cambridge Suite exams. Ah, or okay, that that's kind of stuff. okay. Yeah, that makes more sense now. Okay. Yeah. They usually have, well, they don't usually, but a lot of the times they have some kind of. My exams. son is screaming in the background, <laughs> he's yelling at the, Mama for some reason. It's the ducks. He remembers the ducks. He's gone back into into a fugue state about the ducks. That was really sad. That was really sweet, though. I totally understand. Oh. Um, but yeah, so they have the British Council has exam centers, and then they have um, cultural centers where they'll do. Um, British-based cultural um, activities or events or oh, that okay. kind of things. Okay. And then um, I mainly focus on the teaching centers. So uh, oh, Budapest okay. has a teaching center as well. So yeah, I do. I, I work with them full time. Um, I do adults classes, kids classes, uh, exam preparation classes. And I'm also an IELTS speaking examiner. So oh, okay. when everything kind of starts back up, hopefully I'll be I'll be doing some examining and stuff again. Too. Oh, so do you do you sometimes do uh, like proctor exams for like the IGCSE and stuff like that? Or no, I don't know how you to don't... do any of those. Unfortunately, okay, those are no. different. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, that's the world that I'm living in. I because okay. I, I teach at uh, International School of Budapest, mm -hmm. and uh, so I have students from eighth. Well, right now I'm the eighth grade homeroom teacher. Um, mm -hmm. I, I teach all the way up through the IB system. Okay, um, and so eighth, ninth, and tenth grade they do the they do the the British curriculum, the the Cambridge, the GCSEs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know we have, uh, that's its own kind of animal. Um, yeah. And then, then they switch from the, after 10th grade, they go into either pre-IB or IB, which okay. is kind of like advanced placement high school stuff, you know. And it looks good if you're applying for foreign universities, am I right? Yeah, it looks particular. well, yeah, it looks particularly good if you're going to a, like a British, at a British university mm. for sure, uh, because okay. it's kind of also originates in the British system but um, but even in the United States um, a lot of high school kids that say like I teach geography right so mm -hmm. a lot of kids who are taking IB level geography when they go to a university even in the United States they might they might actually take those IB units that they took okay. and trans and transfer those and they'll actually take them in lieu of like taking say introduction to geography or you know or something Wicked. like that yeah it's pretty cool um and it's and it's it's really high level stuff it's really um like teaching it is a challenge because mm -hmm. you have well you'll respect this is we have you know for instance i have a 10th grade classroom with 18 students and um i would say there's like four distinct levels of English speaking and writing ability in there. <laughs> I mean, it is no joke, you know, trying to explain. It's like, let's talk about population dynamics, you know, and, and then, you know, trying to get everybody on the same page in the same way, it's just impossible. So you, you yeah. actually have to teach the same material four different ways in a certain sense. And There's a lot of that's been a real learning there. curve for me. That's been a challenge. That's fair. I mean, like, I, I, yeah, I definitely know exactly what you mean. I find 
I deal with that with a lot of um, kids' classes. Uh -huh. um, we, we base a lot of our children's classes on age. So right. um, you could have a seven-year-old who is in like your little one situation where like pretty much fluent totally fine yeah no problems with english and then you could have someone who speaks absolutely nothing so right, trying to right. make that material like or they yeah, can write but they pain. can't speak or they can speak yeah. but they can't write or you know exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah it's yeah it's a beast and a half yeah. to try to deal with yeah it really is yeah um so so you're from so you're from canada originally yep. right yep. um so what part of canada are you from well, it's a bit of a tricky question, that one, I suppose. Uh -huh. um, so my father was in the military, so we moved uh -huh. around quite a bit. Military um, brat, as they're, yeah. as they're called, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, so home, I guess for me, if I talk like now home is where my parents live. Uh -huh. um, and they live on the east coast of Canada um, okay. in, on an island called Cape Breton. Oh, wow. Um, so that's kind of home. Um, but I went to university in New Brunswick. Uh -huh. um, spent most of my high school time near Toronto um, in a town called St. Catharines, just kind of two hours south. Sure. And before that, I was in Alberta, which is kind of closer to your end of, of, right. of the Americas kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's where my brother and his family live. They're out in Calgary, Alberta. Oh, um, so yeah. Kind of... I've got a good friend that teaches at University of Calgary there. Oh, cool. He, he loves it there, actually. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. The winters are terrible, but the yeah. people are really friendly, so it kind of makes up for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm from kind of all across, I guess. I, I wouldn't. It'd be hard to pinpoint just one spot. So and also for so maybe for some of our Hungarian listeners or for um, just others who who haven't uh, you know who always wonder about the differences between Canada and and the United States I like to remind people because I'm, I'm a historical geographer is kind of my sort of realm of things and one of the things that we geographers always do in our writing is when we mm -hmm. use the word America we are mm -hmm. always talking about the entire continent of North America we are talking about Central America South America right so when you say something is American you kind of mean everything that's there, right? Yeah. Um, so I like to think of us, uh, uh, us U.S. Americans and Canadians as Americans. Right. And um, and but boy, are we different, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm curious what you think about that as a Canadian. Like, I know people have lots of different thoughts on this. But... For sure, for sure. I mean, I think so. I think the amount that I've traveled has really impacted the way that I see all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you had taken Heather kind of just after university, uh, I would say Canada and America were the exact opposite things and were many <laughs> different. You know, like I would be, I would be maybe a little overly nationalistic about it, and I right. would have a lot of feelings. Um, but yeah. I think, at least from outsiders' That's not how points, you French fries. <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with you? We invented hockey. Yeah. You know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, but like from from traveling so much and kind of seeing and meeting so many other people, there's not a huge like there's not a huge difference really if you're viewing. A Canadian and an American from an outsider point of view. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel like I feel like we seem the same. Um, a lot of the media that we we ingest is the same. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of similarities where kind of having a general conversation, you might not necessarily pick up on a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. So, a I few don't know. words here and there with accent might give yeah. it away, but even then, you probably have to know something about both places and and know people from both places to even spot it yeah so i feel like i feel like canadians and people from the the usa shall we say can see the differences between ourselves much more than anybody else can that's um, a good point I, yeah i think it's kind of interesting i don't know um it's kind of like uh i think of it like australia and new zealand a lot right, of right. people wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference, right? But if you're from New Zealand, you know the difference, and if you're from Australia, you know the difference. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. And they yeah. and they and those they actually get pretty bent out of shape when you mix <laughs> when you mix yeah. them up too. It's kind yeah. of interesting, yeah. It's it's yeah it's 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 different. I don't know. It, it's 
I think it's kind of neat kind of seeing it from an outsider point of view after kind of being away from it for so long uh -huh. and kind of seeing it through through other people's eyes where, you know, if, if someone thought I was from the States, unless I told them that I was from Canada, I don't know how they would know that and I don't know how I would right. expect them to. Right, um, right. You know, especially like people whose English is not their first language or if they're just not... You know, if they can't hear the accent differentiation, which is not necessarily huge, depending on who you're speaking to. Right. Um, right. You know, it's it's kind of it's a fine line, but um, I don't know. Differences wise, I suppose, I suppose at the moment, um, if you look at the political systems, they're quite different. Yes. Um, yeah. Between Canada and, and the states, we've got kind of different different parties in power in in both places and different different kind of leaders. Um, yeah. you've got a multi-party parliamentary parliamentarian type yeah we're more system. like the british system yeah, yeah exactly um yeah so that's that's a bit different most of the media like i say we we in we have is pretty much the same but we've got um the canadian government does a lot to support canadian content right so right. most like radio stations and stuff like that need to play at least 30 percent canadian content um throughout the day yeah. So we get which, it which in the U.S. we would call that's propaganda, you know, <laughs> you know that's, a, that's a government getting into my shit, you know, exactly, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> where we're just like, well, they've already spent our tax dollars. I guess we can listen to it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's worse, th worse, worse things for them to spend their spend the government money on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and things like having a universal health care system, yes. you know, yeah. things like that. I mean, the, th this actually speaks to some of my, you know, actually some of the origin of my podcast actually would, mm -hmm. you know, burnt out in Budapest is this idea that, you know, basically my between my wife and I, we just became really burnt out on trying to like achieve some kind of quality of life in the United States. Yeah. Me being a, a teacher who was like working two adjunct positions oh, wow. and her just trying to find some kind of work that was close to the field in which she's educated in after mm -hmm. spending several years at home taking care of all of her, you know, while I was securely employed, you know, we, we just got to a point where it was like, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to end up on the street. I mean, like, yeah. it's just, it's like you are either making it in the U.S. or you are just down and out, you know. Yeah. And we, with now that we had a, a, a kid to think about, we just couldn't take that risk anymore. And lucky for us, you know, we had the privilege to, to decide to move to Hungary because yeah. we have family here and, you know, we have other connections to the place and because I'm a native speaker it was easy to find some work and she actually found work right away here as well Great. and so it was it was but now that we're here and we've been here for a year I've talked to a lot of friends of mine in the United States about how odd it is to look at your homeland mm -hmm. you know from outside of it and mm. at first, you you don't think you've really changed that much. You don't think it's really that different. But the mm -hmm. when you start looking at the politics and something like the COVID crisis, like how countries deal with it, you know, those kind of things, you start to really feel like, at least in my case, um, we literally feel like, boy, we got out, you know, just, at just the right time. in time. I mean, it's yeah. like, it is so difficult in the United States right now. And um, I'm not, I don't know much about how Canada's handling it. I actually haven't heard that much about it. Um, but in the U.S., it's just, it's just, it's a, it's, 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 you know, got to the level of socioeconomic crisis, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just because they're just so unprepared and so unwilling to spend money to make sure people don't end up homeless or don't yeah. end up with no jobs. And they're, they're not guaranteeing salaries for anybody all around Europe. They're paying people a certain percentage of their salary so that they don't end up, you know, totally desperate. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Which seems logical. You would think you would want to keep the economy going if you possibly could. Right? In some way. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As far as, I mean, I'm kind of removed from a lot of it. Um, uh, but as far yeah. as I know, in terms of Canada stuff, like, 
Um, if you're affected, um, so like if you lost your job or something like that, they have a special kind of form of unemployment mm -hmm. that they can provide, um, which I think is about $2,000 uh, two a month, which would be the same as kind of the, um, the U.S. stimulus because um, sure. the Canadian dollar is trash. But every month <laughs> as opposed to one time. <laughs> yeah, yes. But yeah, right. but everyone, yeah, everyone for as long as it lasts. As long right. as you are in some way affected. So, like, um, as long as you, you don't have to be a citizen to, to get it. Um, wow, as long that's as you've interesting. Been, yeah, as long as you've been living in Canada and you've been working in Canada and you have a claim to that. Yeah, you've then, been paying your taxes and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. They're they're willing to kind of help you out. Um, from what I've heard, talking to my parents back home, everything's still pretty like there's a lot of restrictions in place. Things are still pretty locked down, but there's a general feeling of okay, if this is what we're supposed to do, then this is what we're gonna do. Right. You know, if we have to stay at home, we have to stay at home. We stay at home. Whatever, it's cool. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, we also don't have like. Canada's population density is really it's like one person per 50 kilometers or something yeah. like that we have a we don't have a lot of people so yeah. it sounds like at least on the east coast it's being kept relatively in check mm -hmm. um, and they don't have too 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 many cases and the cases that they have they're they're kind of taken good care of so it seems like at least from here it seems like they're handling it well, um, well that's good but yeah. It might be different on the ground, right? Like it might be different actually sure. being there. Sure. And it's, you know, it's another thing that comes with looking at places from the outside in is that mm -hmm. we, we also look through tinted glasses, right? You know, it's very easy for me as a, as an expat who left under difficult circumstances anyway, mm -hmm. to look at, look back and go, oh man, they're really screwing this one up, you know, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, it's, um. It just, it does make me, it makes me worry for so many people there, you know, that like, it's, it's a privilege to be able to stay home, right? Mm -hmm. you, we can see that here in, here in Hungary, right? Definitely, you know, um, yeah. In, in Hungary, we've had, I mean, I think we've been so far pretty darn lucky um, mm -hmm. in terms of the effect that COVID has had on us. Uh, but it's i can only imagine the the economic trauma that some of our lower paid workers have mm -hmm. had to deal with you know with not being able to work cuz the average pay in hungary is is just a little over what rent is for a lot yeah. of us right you know and so that's a really tough position to be in you know Definitely. many many households have 3 4 workers in them and uh, you know same thing in the united states right so you have all these people who are just barely squeaking by uh -huh. and then all of a sudden they're supposed to just stay home and yeah. that's like that's great if you're like an upper middle class white person with a solid job right <laughs> but you know yeah. the the vast majority of the urban popula uh, population of the world like doesn't can't doesn't have that luxury they need to go no. to work every single yeah. day and if they don't they're screwed you know yeah they and don't so eat they, they can't make yeah. yeah so it's a really uh it's a tough uh it is a tough nut to crack all over the world, I think. But some countries are, are definitely handling it a little better than others. Um, but so far, I mean, it seems like, I don't know about how you feel about it, but here in Hungary, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a pretty strict lockdown Yeah. pretty early. Um, mm -hmm. And I think people are actually handling it quite well. I don't know if you've noticed, but since they kind of relaxed the the... The quarantine over the mm -hmm. last, you know, several days or whatever. Um, I feel like it's it's pretty intense in the city. Like I, yeah. I feel like <laughs> things have gotten. People are like really intense. I've yeah. seen like fights break out with the with the Roma people on the trains and you you know and just like lots of you know. There's like I think people were a little shell shocked when all of a sudden everybody was out again. I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's completely normal too. Like I've got a friend, um, I've still got friends that are based in Korea from my time there. Um, uh -huh. so they, they really of, locked down. They, they did. Korea. And I mean, yeah. they, um, they, they're kind of like, I want to say like a month ahead of us in terms of all of this stuff. So right. when it first started, I kind of looked to my friend to be like, okay, what do I have in store for me? 
how was your first month? What did you do? How did it go? Tell me, tell me what to expect sort of thing. Yeah. And when people started going back to work there, it was just tiny, stupid little arguments exploding into hysterical tears. And, and I think, I think it's just like, we've been, there's so much uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. And like, no one knows how to, to deal with it. And then once you finally have the opportunity to, to relax a little bit, or you feel like you're getting some of that certainty back, I feel like all of that stress and all of those, those concerns, they just, they smash right through and they come up in really nasty ways. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think everybody's gonna have to deal with that on some level, whether it's not like, whether it's you have a fight with your boss, you have a fight with your spouse, um, you get into it with the bus driver, like whatever the case might be, I think yeah. stress is bubbling up in really weird ways with people now that um, things are starting to kind of re-stabilize and re-normalize. You know, I've even, I've seen it, I'm sure you've seen it in yourself too, but I, I have seen it uh, in my own, uh, the way I've responded. Mm -hmm. um, I, I even made a Facebook post about this the other day, about how um, I got so used to being able to go to Valdosmayor, which I live really close to, which is a great park, mm -hmm. and and like shoot baskets and do whatever I want. You know, it's like almost like having your own park. I mean, like it was just never anyone around and all of us yeah. dog owners were like having nice little dog meetups every night and, you know <laughs> and it was just so peaceful it was like yeah. amazing and i didn't realize that i was getting so used to this thing where so few people were around yeah and uh and it's just and the other day i went to shoot some hoops and and it was just overrun with people like it was impossible mm -hmm. to get a bat to get any court time and uh and i was like upset about it i'm like and after a while i was like saying to myself what am i upset about i mean this is <laughs> like this is ridiculous right i live in yeah. a, a city with like two million people and i'm mm -hmm. pissed because i can't get an open court to myself you i know? get it though no i, I mean <laughs> i totally understand what you mean though it's it's like what you've as much, I think, as much as we can in the situations we're in, we've tried to make it normal and comfortable and acceptable for ourselves, right? So, like, yeah. my friend jokes that I've turned into this kind of crazy tinfoil hat-wearing, like, person <laughs> who skulks through the streets on the random days that they have to leave their apartment. Um, she's not, I mean, she's not that wrong, <laughs> really. I mean, I'm pretty close to that at this stage, but I've done everything possible to just stay at home to just never leave this this place where i live um and you start to get used to it after a while it's do. almost a little bit of a security blanket right totally and yeah. i remember like the first during the first couple of weeks of of uh, kind of the lockdown or the stay-at-home order um when i would have to go out to get something like groceries or um i don't know milk anything at all i would get these intense headaches and i was like this is wow. weird why is this happening? And then as soon as I would go home, they'd be fine. They'd go. I thought, ah, oh, this is just like intense stress. Yeah. That's concerning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I'm becoming agoraphobic or something, you know? <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. It's exactly like that. It's so yeah. weird. And now that things have started to open up, I live, uh, so I live in the seventh district. Oh, um, okay. Quite, yeah. Quite close to Varoshligets. And are you um, also near, like, is uh, is uh, Simpla Kert not far from you guys, from where you are? Uh, it's it's not so far, but it's not so close. It would oh, take okay. me maybe like twenty minutes to walk to it, maybe. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. something like that. Yeah, so you're, on how far. so you're really in the city there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm about, I'm like a stone's throw away from, from the park, from Varish Liget. Nice, um, nice. I can, there's a, they've got a giant um, hot air balloon kind of uh, playground area that I can see as soon as I leave my building. Oh, uh, okay, um, yeah. So, oh, so, uh, so yeah, so I've been in the 7th district and I've just kind of been chilling, been doing my own thing, been walking around, seeing dogs occasionally, um, but it, I've noticed there's been a lot more people out on the streets the last couple of days. Anytime I go out to grab something, it's just, you can see so many more people starting to pour out of everywhere. And it just makes me, I don't know, it makes me a little bit 
little bit freaked out and it shouldn't yeah. it's all in my head it's totally in my head yeah yeah i'm totally the same like i you know if i have to like venture into the mall you know here uh, the mm -hmm. mamut mall or something to get uh and actually the other day i got my son some rollerblades because he, he, he wanted to roll he's learned to learn how to rollerblade and cool. so we had to go to the nugati area mm -hmm. and so i was in the nugati Pyodvar and and also at the uh the decathlon which is just like across the way there mm -hmm. and um and it was just like it was stressful it was just yeah. for me it was just like and normally I kind of like to be out amongst a lot of people. I like, that's one of the things I love about Budapest is you can be mm -hmm. anonymous among millions, as yeah, I like definitely. to say, you know. And same thing that New York has and Chicago has, like all the big cities, they have that thing, you know. Um, and, but now it's like, now I've gotten used to being anonymous among nobody, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and now we go out and it's you're just it's almost like all these people are walking at me what are they doing you know you know like should i run you know you know it's almost like your inner voice is like it's like a zombie attack movie or something you know and and you yeah. have to run from the crowd and it's but it's just it's like okay whew, just breathe this is a normal okay. life we're just trying to be normal again that's all mm -hmm. this is yeah it's it's really it's really odd well, hey, before, so I, I, I don't want us to go on too long uh, okay. because it's very easy to do that, um, <laughs> especially with me. I'm, I'm, this is why I have a podcast. I like to talk. That's awesome. That's um, good. <laughs> so uh, one thing that you mentioned when, when we were sort of doing our little pre-interview was mm -hmm. um, that we did online um, – was you mentioned that you're really passionate about like mental health advocacy yeah, and sure. LGBTQI rights, mm -hmm. um, and um, and I, I that I'm I'm interested in that. I'd like to know more about that if you'd be willing to talk about it. Um, sure. I'm definitely somebody who I really I really uh, respect those who do work for mental health because I think it's the it's perhaps the most misunderstood aspect of um mainstream culture definitely you know like definitely. we just we don't realize how many of us actually do have very serious mental health issues and whether they're diagnosed or not and yeah. uh, and uh, it's important to think through i mean i think i think with mental health it's one of those things where whether you know it or not you've you've dealt with, worked with, loved somebody who has had issues with mental health, whether they are severe issues or whether they aren't, right? Yeah. And there's still, I mean, I think still so, so much, there's a huge stigma around, around mental health, around talking about problems that you have, mm -hmm. around trying to access help and get help. Um, and it's one of the things that I, I think I really, really like about Canada. And the more that I've traveled, the more I've realized that Canada's pretty good in this respect i think i can say i have heard will, that before actually i think i think canada is still severely underfunded i think we need more money for public mental health um, and that kind of thing but i don't know if i could point to a country that isn't like mm -hmm. that has enough money for this sure. kind of thing so yeah, sure. um i do think i do think we still need a lot more money for for that kind of stuff but there definitely isn't as much of a stigma so the concept of you know you're under a lot of stress. You need to take time off of work because of it. You're dealing with anxiety issues, something like that. Mm -hmm. That in Canada is accepted. You can file for unemployment. You explain to your boss with a medical certificate. And yeah, everybody gets it. And there's no, there's no kind of... There's no kind of backlash or maybe... There's no of, guilty until proven innocent, you know, nah. in, in, in regard to you trying to game the system because yeah. of your mental condition yeah exactly and i think i think people are willing to have a lot more open kind of conversations about mental health and the stuff that affects us and that kind of thing and i think as an educator um if i could if i could call myself as such uh <laughs> i think i do my best to try to make sure the people that i encounter whether they're their co-workers or whether they're students or whatever the case might be that they're aware of maybe some of the issues that people don't necessarily talk about all the time and yeah, that if yeah. if they need someone to talk to, I'm quite happy to kind of chew their ear off about this thing <laughs> for yeah, as long as I yeah. can. Or at least um, point them in the direction of somebody who might be able to help and all those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. 
which can be super challenging, especially in a second language. Um, you know, yeah. like me trying to give, say, a Hungarian um, friend advice on where to go if they're they're being abused or, or something like that, or they need to leave their spouse. Like, right. I'm still not really aware of which what is a huge is problem here, here in Budapest. <laughs> Or in Hungary, like like yeah. we, we don't like talking about that, but, but the COVID and same in the United States, the COVID mm-hmm. crisis, for example, has opened the door to levels of of uh, physical and mental abuse that we're not even closely prepared to deal with. And it's because yeah. people are stuck at home with people they usually try to stay away from. In many one cases. of the yeah, one of the really cool things that I found about out about recently is there um, there are a series. Oh, there's a series. There's a bunch of um, psychologists that, because of this whole coronavirus stuff, are offering five hours of pro bono counseling. Oh. Um, so you can, if you're in a situation, maybe like kind of what we're talking about, or maybe you're just dealing with anxiety. You don't know how to cope. Uh, you know, your your kids are being homeschooled now. What on earth are you supposed to do with that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, you've got. The, the government, I guess, has provided, or the psychology, the psychological foundation society has provided an outlet for you to, to get some kind of help, which I think is really, really cool. That's great. They're doing that here in, here in Hungary? Yeah, yeah. Oh, There's, fantastic. Um, wow. Yeah, I'd be happy to, like, send you the link. There's a list yeah. of... Maybe I can uh, include that on the podcast notes, you know, like, uh, sure. put a link in there. They've got, like, so they have specialists, uh, they list kind of the doctor's name, the specialist, um, so if they're good with kids psychology or couples therapy or whatever, and um, also if they speak English or any other language that they speak, so That's great. it's, even as an expat, this is something that you could, you could access for free, and it might kind of make the world of difference. Yeah, well, and also, both of us being teachers, um, mm. you know, teachers struggle Oh, yeah. dramatically with mental health issues <laughs> it's uh i mean as a phd student i i you know i i used to kind of laugh it off at when i was first starting but after a while i i knew a lot of colleagues that went through these things and that uh, a lot of uh you know academics especially um mm-hmm. deal with like really severe issues of of uh of anxiety and stress and uh you know fit uh that manifests in, in physical pain and all sorts mm-hmm. of things. And uh, I saw a lot of colleagues have to, something like 40 or 50% of all of my colleagues at the University of Washington in, as graduate students seek some kind of help. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's incredible when you think about it. You know, it's a lot of people that are part of this thing, you know, that a lot of people think is really great and cool and, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. but it's like extremely stressful. And yeah. teachers are are often they are so they spend so much time worrying about the um you know the the health and wellness of their students that mm-hmm. they don't do any self care. Yeah, you know? and we see this like... a lot in grammar and high school teachers. Mm-hmm. It's like an empathetic burnout almost. Like you've you've given as much as you possibly can to your kids, and you want them to be as good as as they can be. That you forget. That yeah. you can't you can't do that if you're empty. You can't give anything if you've got nothing to give. Absolutely, you've, you've yeah. got to take care of yourself too. Yeah, we often joke about how teachers uh, teachers uh, uh, don't make great parents, you know, because <laughs> you know when we come home after teaching all day, and I've I've even caught myself saying this to my five year old son, like he could possibly understand it, you know, and I say mm. I say Olchi, I just can't. I need some space. I've been teaching all day. I can't like answer your questions right now. You know, like just give me because he's in that space where he's like, "Daddy, why do we have skin? Why is the sky blue today, yeah. but it was not yesterday? Why are oh. there plants growing on the wall on the building next to us?" I mean, it's just you yeah. know endless Everything. questions all day. You know, and so and there's days when I come home from teaching, I just don't want to talk to anybody. I don't mm-hmm. want to like interact with anybody, and but I have to because I'm daddy. You know, yeah. and it's and it's uh, it's stressful. And a lot of uh, one of my bosses uh, my, is one of the most well adjusted people I know. But she's got three daughters, you know, and so yeah. she comes home and is, is and they're like teenagers and stuff, too. So it's it's like, wow. You know, so she just <laughs> talks and you can tell when she's reached her level, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she just has to like cut off, you know. Capacity <laughs> overload. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's true. I think too, in a lot of cases, um, teachers kind of have to be a little bit mindful of how they meet their social needs. So I think yeah. sometimes, especially if you're in like, if you're in a new country, like if you've just come to Budapest, this is your first teaching gig, you've never done this kind of thing before, you don't know very many people, yeah. it's very easy to fall into your social needs are being met by your students. And I think Ooh, good point. That's, a, yeah. that's a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing. You know, you, you need to make sure that you you do have those social connections outside of your students. Or yeah, yeah. Especially if you're teaching older students, I would imagine mm. that would be, you know, I, I did a little bit of that when I was uh, first here, when I was teaching mm-hmm. like business English, you know, stuff like that to professionals and you know, and it's, uh, I could, I could imagine that, like, if you had a lot of private students or something, mm-hmm. you, know, you start to see them as friends and all that, which is probably fine, but if that's your only, you know, outlet for social activity, boy, that's gonna, that's gonna burn you out real fast. Definitely, and I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because I think you want to build rapport as a teacher, right? Like, you yeah. don't want it to be this kind of stern, okay, today we study grammar, and then you go and buy, and that's it. You want to yeah. have this kind of, what'd you do on the weekend? You know, what are you sure. up to? Yeah. You got any plans? Yeah. And it so quickly can fall into something that, you know, is at its heart a business transaction. Yeah. <laughs> and you, yeah. you shouldn't really consider to be a bestie. I mean, sometimes yeah. that can happen. I know a lot of people who have made um, like lifelong partners out of ex-students and that kind of thing. But uh-huh. they've met in a classroom, time has passed, they've met in alternative situations, fallen in love and, you know, that kind of thing happens. But I think, I don't know, I think it's something that, that you also kind of have to be a little bit mindful of if you're, if you're especially if you're new to a place. I yeah. think it's quite easy. Yeah. I know for me, like learning the, just getting used to the culture here, um, mm-hmm. cause I had never, the longest I had ever lived in Budapest nonstop was like maybe say like four or five months at a okay. time. Yeah. So this is the first time I've been here for a whole year and where I knew I was going to be here for the long haul. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it was, um, interesting to like, I had to learn so much about like what work culture is like here, mm-hmm. you know, how you may, may understand this actually, uh, a friend of mine, when I first started my job who's who's also, uh, American mm-hmm. told me, she said, you know, you, one thing that you'll notice about teaching in, in Hungary or just working in Hungary is you have to get into the, the circle of suffering. <laughs> she <laughs> called it. <laughs> or oh, something I love along that. those lines, you know, and, and, and she said, it's like, you, the, no one will fully accept you until you've reached a point where you can like adequately gripe about like the job and the government and, you know, mm-hmm. and all these things like you have to be able to, it's like once you've entered that grieving circle, which is usually a bunch of people standing outside smoking during a break, you know, <laughs> or something like that, you know, like then then you'll start to be accepted. Until then, you're just the American interloper, you know, you know, uh, you're just you're just the foreigner who's who's like you know, not quite like part of the scene yet, you know. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. That is such a cool way of putting it. And I think, I mean, I think I fit in nicely to that. I do like a good complain. So I think, I think maybe I'm more fit for Budapest than I ever, I ever previously <laughs> yeah. knew. I do like, I do like a good moan every now and again yeah, about sure. something. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that. That's, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of cool. I, I was coming, I'm coming from Sri Lanka where the work culture is very different. Um, I bet, yeah. And yeah. kind of readjusting to more westernized ways of approaching things, westernized ways of dealing with problems, mm-hmm. of organizing work. It took me a little while at the very beginning to get used to, to how to phrase things and how to get my point across and also what to expect. Um, right. But I feel like that's kind of settled now, which is quite nice. Yeah. And yeah. So why don't we end with this question? Um, sure. I think this will be an interesting little uh, foray, which is, um, so you've, you've been here for close to a year now, mm-hmm. um, and I've been here for a year. So what are your favorite things 
about Ooh. our fair city of Budapest. And and also, what are your least favorite? Ooh, ooh, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, okay, so my favorite things. Oof, I like that now. But maybe this isn't super specific to Budapest, but I like that now I'm starting to be a local in some places. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So I really like that I've hit the the point in living here that I can go into the bakery at the foot of my road and they know me, they know what's up, they can talk to me. Hey, um, that's a big thing in Budapest, the bakery, man. I mean, you know, it's important it is, to have a good relationship with your baker. Oh my gosh, yeah, that was, when I first got here, like, Sri Lankan bread, it's nothing, Oof. it's nothing to write home mm, about. Yeah. I think I ate four liver pastries a day for the first <laughs> week when I arrived. I love, I love those pastries. I love the, like, the chikamayash. ash. Yeah. Oh, my, oh, it's so good. Um, and the bread here is, like, pretty much to die for. Like, yes. I mean, it's, a, a standard Hungarian loaf would be, like, six bucks in America. I mean, Definitely. It's, it's, and here it's, like, what, a dollar? If that, yeah. <laughs> I, and I love <laughs> that, like. If you translate it, you know. Right? I love that, too, in the bakeries here, it's. It's not just like, okay, we've got white bread, we've got brown bread. It's like we have seven yeah. different kinds of brown bread, mm-hmm. and then we've got seven different kinds of white bread. Which one would you like? I was like I'll have one of all of them, I guess. It's <laughs> yeah. the, the easiest way. Um, yeah. And I love the cakes, the cakes, the oh. desserts that you get here. So oh my amazing. God. Yeah, they're not oversweet. That, no. that, that's the first thing I know. I, my wife was always griping about that in the U.S. We would get a mm-hmm. donut or get a cupcake or whatever and it was just so sweet it's like they Mm -hmm. drop a pound of sugar in there for no for no reason it's just like Mm. why does it have to be so sweet and you come here and it's just it's just amazing it's almost like in some cases it's it's like it's not even that sweet it's more the creaminess and the texture and all these things I remember when I first came here and I was told which I think is still a thing that they have like a yearly cake competition oh god um, I, I think it's all right. Yeah, I think it's all across Hungary, and like you, it, but it might only be in Budapest. I'm not 100 percent sure about this, but different bakeries will put forward a cake, and then whatever bakery wins, they get to. I don't know if they get money, but it's something like they get to have their cake distributed all over the place, and they become like moderately famous for. Oh. For a period of time and that's where a lot of the really really good cakes that like or the good desserts that you would try they've come from this competition huh, and interesting. a country that has a cake competition is aces in my book oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> live right well. next to a, a bakery called august i don't know if you've okay. ever been to august it's it's one of the older bakeries in uh in in budapest actually and they kind of specialize in the pastries and stuff I think and I know it. It's unbelievable. They also have like mind-blowingly good ice cream. Mm. Like in this on a on a summer day, you get they have like the rice and green tea, you know, all the really cool flavors and Yeah. And they make these cakes like god, they're just amazing. They and they and of course they have marzipan frosting and mm. you know, with the little figures that you can eat and it's just like it's okay. just artistry. It's it's <laughs> absolutely amazing. That's yeah, it's fabulous. I agree. I went to my friends. I have some friends who live out near Kellenfeld, uh-huh. um, out by the train station, and there's a little bakery slash ice cream place there, and I think it's called Erdush, or that mm. might be the name of the cake that they make. Uh-huh. Best cake ever, and they've <laughs> made it into an ice cream, Whoa. so you can get the ice cream, and it's like nuts. So there's like. There's some sunflower seed, pistachios, chocolate, a little bit of hazelnut. Um, it's a really, really interesting, interesting blend of flavors. Really, really nice. Wow. Um, for, you hung- for you, for uh, you, uh, U.S. Americans out there, you have not had cake yet. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you that right now. You have not had cake until you've had cake in Central Europe, which it, of course also includes Austria and to some degree Germany, but definitely Austria. Yeah. Um, if you take a trip over the border, they have amazing cakes there. So um, good. Yeah. So what 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 what's another couple of things that you really like about Budapest? Um, I love I love the sunsets. I love the view from anywhere near the water. Um, mm. So like anytime I get to be kind of near the Danube at sunset or um, kind of as the sun is going down in the early evening, beautiful. I love it. I love how. 
people just kind of flock outside and there's such a such an outdoor culture that doesn't really exist in Canada in the same way like the terrace kind of vibe I suppose yeah I mean. that's a really good point yeah I really like that too it's like the cool. cafes always have like if it's a sidewalk cafe or something there's mm-hmm. always people and like, then and like it keeps the thing going yeah and within the the weird bits of the season so in spring or in autumn yeah. you're still outside but yeah. here's a blanket yeah here's yeah. a blanket why don't yeah. we do that? Yeah, that's why don't we still go outside and just put something on that's yeah. season appropriate? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so simple, but I do yeah. like that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really, really good. I really like that. I also, um, I live, you know, I can ride my, what I love to do is get on my bike and ride down to the river. Um, mm. It's a nice little ride because it's all downhill to the river, so it's super easy to go down there. And then it's a little bit of uphill back, so you get a little exercise. But on the way there, uh, or when I get down there, it's really nice to go down there right around, well, this time of year, like maybe, you know, 6, 6.30, mm-hmm. something like it's just, sun's just starting to go down, and my God, the, 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 the parliament and the chain bridge and just all the stuff in, in that lighting. It's gorgeous. It really is something. I mean, you can understand why there's so many artists that, you know, yeah. that, that paint that kind of scenery. For sure. It's, it's, it's stunning. And it's, yeah, it's, it's something that I don't ever really get tired of, but I find I don't let myself see often enough. So it's almost kind of like I forget about it, but whenever I see it, it's just like, it hits me again, fresh, how beautiful it is. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The only other place I've ever lived where I feel the same way is San Francisco. Ah, Um, Because I'm, I'm kind of from the San Francisco Bay area and the Golden Gate Bridge Mm. is like that it's i've 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 been over it a gazillion times in my life but every time you see that bridge just popping through the fog and you know you know that that it's just it's 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 like transcendent mm-hmm. you know it's like it's like how did they do this <laughs> you know like, Gorgeous. it's so yeah. beautiful you know and, and it's uh and budapest has a lot of especially with the architecture and just I always tell this funny story of when I was first meeting my wife and we were walking around Budapest and we rounded a corner and I see this church mm-hmm. and I was like, God, what church is that? That's amazing. Like I'm just flipping my lid at this thing, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I, I said, what is this? It's gotta be a landmark. What is this? And she goes, um, it's the neighborhood church. <laughs> I don't know. It's, you know, it's just it's always been here. It's not that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was like right then I realized, oh man, I'm that dorky American that like just hasn't seen anything built before like 1700, you know, or whatever. I had the same. I had the same thing when I moved into my first apartment. I had an apartment with a courtyard, uh-huh. and in my mind, you know, apartments with old courtyards are things of Disney creation, and they yeah. don't really exist, <laughs> you know. But almost all of them have that here. Yeah. Exactly. And I was I was freaking out about it to the friends that I had made on my Celta course, um, most of which were Hungarian. And my, my friend Zsuzsa was like, are you serious? Like, that, this is really that exciting for you? Of course it is. It's amazing. I have a courtyard. <laughs> Couldn't get over it. So, yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah, yeah it's funny. Um, now, what about <laughs> what about your least favorite things about Budapest? Oof. Um, I don't know. Wow. Uh, I mean, on a personal level, my gas bill has definitely been one of my least favorite things about uh, Budapest. Yeah, it is kind I, of expensive, isn't it? In the winter, man, it, it yeah. killed me. It yeah. killed me. Um, but that being said, I mean, most of my utilities are are quite low, so I probably shouldn't complain. Um, <laughs> You know, like the water, the price for water here is significantly cheaper than it would be at home. Same for electric. Uh So I probably shouldn't moan as much as I do about it. But um, what else don't I really like? I don't know. um, Where I live, there tends to be an awful lot of dog shit everywhere. Um, because I'm so close to the park and because everybody has dogs. And they tend not to, to like... clean it up. That's a yeah. pet peeve of mine. That's oh a... my gosh. Oh, so that, that's a little bit frustrating. But I think, I think most people in District 7 would agree that that's just, that's part of District 7. You just have to, yeah. just have to get used yeah. to keeping your eyes on the road when you're walking. <laughs> it's kind of um... like France in that sense. 
<laughs> yeah, I suppose, nobody yeah. cleans their dog shit in France. I don't. I don't oh. know what the deal is with that, but there's just like dog shit on the sidewalks. Oh yeah, in no, I, just... I, I never understood this, and that, and like they're okay with it. They just step yeah. over it or something. It's a, I it's... don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's different. That's for sure. I'll, um, I'll give you one. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. You probably that, that maybe will ring true to you only after I say it. Okay. Which is the toilets. Oh, no, I like the poop shelf. You like the poop shelf? I like the poop shelf. <laughs> See, now I hate the poop shelf because <laughs> here's the thing. I like to look at my poop. Sure. I, I mean, I think it's great. I think it's important to look at your poop. You know, I'm very mm -hmm. much like the Germans in that sense, yeah. right? Because these are German style. That's where they. I've I've actually researched the history of this. They they, the 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 poop shelf is a German style toilet, okay. which says everything, right? Because Germans are very analytical. They they you know you, they're the type of people that would want to look at the poop, right? You know, mm -hmm. make sure you're healthy, right? Um, but here's the thing: when you flush, a lot of now. Sorry, folks. This is you know <laughs> we're gonna get into poop talk for a minute here. But when you flush, it just doesn't want to go down half the time. Yeah, you know, it just sits true. there. You know, and 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 you know, so you you've got Hungarian bathrooms where they have the you know the little toilet bowl cleaner or whatever, and it's mm -hmm. got poop on it. Yeah, I, I can't deal with that. Like, like it's, it's there's a part of me that's a little bit of a neat freak, not like a hmm. germaphobe or anything. But I have this <laughs> like, so I actually have two two toilet cleaners in my bathroom. You know, one that is for pushing the poop, mm -hmm. and one that is for actually cleaning. You know, you know, and okay. the one that you actually clean with should never touch poop. Like, like right. unless, unless you're in cleaning mode, which is mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, of course, my wife actually used it to push poop once, you know, so now I have to go get another one, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's this, this is so this is one of my few big gripes about Budapest. Like, you know, if you're going to have a poop shelf toilet, right, you know, make it one that is easy to flush, like, like you know, like I want to look at it and then I want to flush it. I don't want to have to, like, chip continue. away at it for a while, you know, before it. <laughs> falls down the hole right yeah and the no, other thing is if you're a man and you want to stand up and pee oh you know it's you you, you know is it like a i don't back, want to get into too much splash? of the anatomy yeah, yeah but yeah, you know yeah. it's sort of like you got to lean over the thing a little bit to try to oh, get okay. right into the hole or you know so for those of you who don't know the, huh. the, the hungarian toilets it's like the hole that in a like a north american toilet the hole is usually in the center Mm -hmm. Or kind of in the back, right? And there's a pool of water. So when you when you stand up and pee, you can pee into a pool of water, and it's not splashing everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in a Hungarian toilet, there's just this. The hole is in the front. So if you're sitting down and you're peeing, it's, it's fine. fine, right? So my theory is that part of the deal with the Hungarian toilets is that if you're a, a proper, you know, Hungarian, you sit and you pee. I guess maybe there must I, be never... some history to that. I, I I don't know, but I, I honestly, until you said it, I had never really thought about that. But that makes that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> right. See, I, yeah, I was like, oh wait, yeah. As soon as you said, like, if you stand, I was like, yeah, it's gonna splash back. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So hence, those of you who wonder when you go into if if you're ever stuck in a you know a unisex bathroom and you notice mm -hmm. that the that the toilet has got pee splashed all over the place. Well, that's probably because somebody peed standing up. And they, yeah, they missed And there's just, ah. how do you, you know, yeah. So anyway, you know, hmm. that's a little, that's some inside knowledge. That's some inside Hungarian knowledge right there for folks. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, but it's, it's one of those things, right? Like that you forget that is really, really weird, but affects your everyday life. And then someone new comes and you're kind of like, oh yeah, no, I forgot to tell you about that. Sorry. Um, that's a whole different situation. Um, yeah, it's true. It's really true. I think, I don't know if there's, the only other thing I think that kind of, that kind of bugs me that's a little bit like that is, no, no, but that's not 100% true. See, I'm a big fan of um, German pillows, like the big giant square dudes that are like, uh, okay. I don't know. I don't want to say a meter by a meter because that's too big. But the big kind of giant square German pillows that you can get. They're like and kind of fluffy. Yeah, they're fluffy and they're, they're square. They're kind uh -huh, of the size uh -huh. of like 
your upper body. Right. Um, and I guess if you wanted <laughs> wow. to, you could kind of fold them in half. Um, I want to say they're like 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters. They're wow. quite large. Yeah. Um, and it's impossible to buy bedding for those here. It's, it's Amazon or nothing. Oh, and hey, while we're talking about it, um, ordering anything from yeah. outside of Budapest um, or outside of Hungary is, is often a pain in the butt. It is. If it's... you're going straight from China, you can get good deals because we have a pretty <laughs> good relationship trade-wise with China. Uh, but like, I wanted to order like some Fruit of Loom undershirts, you know, just mm-hmm. white T-shirts, and they cost like, you know, pack of four of them was like fifteen euro, you know, yeah. roughly, right? But it would have cost me thirty-five euro to ship them. To ship them, mm-hmm. and they weigh what? All of like less than a pound. I mean, it it just is mind blowing. Like, so I don't know what the deal is with that, but the Hungarian tariffs—that's one thing I would say that is kind of a drag. But that's the not other... really like a boot, like a particular thing to the city. That's more just like commerce. No, that's than, true. You know. But yeah, I I deal an awful lot with the post office. So the other problem I suppose I have, which I guess isn't necessarily Budapest centric, is. My mailbox is too small for anything of any relevance. Yeah, nobody. <laughs> that's true. We all, everybody has the same size. They look like what yeah. we would call PO boxes, right? You exactly. Know, in America, yeah. And I have to constantly go down to the post office to pick up a package. And whenever I have to pick up the package, I look at it and I think you could have put that in my in my mailbox. You or could've. left it you by the door. They they just they <laughs> assume Hungarians assume that they cannot do that because someone will steal it. Mm-hmm. There is a little bit of a thief, thievery fear, you know, here. Maybe from from years past. Who knows? There might be a history Mm. of that too. Well, as you can see, there's there's I there's really not a whole lot to gripe about in terms of (laughs) Budapest. I mean, it's really um, you know one of the greatest cities that I've ever been to and definitely lived in. The ability, the fact that we can jump on a tram and go, or or a bus, or or an underground train or, or, or a train or any number of um ways you can get anywhere in this city from anywhere mm-hmm. it's mind-boggling the transportation system here it's it's, it's, it's like amazing. such a high quality of life in terms of being able to just go places and it's reasonably priced and it's it is. you know so i always tell people like that's one of the things that just you know sells me on the place like you can completely live here without ever thinking about buying a car i agree i agree and i think i think it's it runs almost all the time you would need it there's even night buses so i mean you're never you're never really stuck um and it is it's affordable it's affordable it's clean it works it's good yeah and yeah so i guess it's just we was we just basically like budapest there's not a whole yeah. lot to argue about what's bad about budapest so. no we've got we've got a, a a divisive moment there with the poop shelf yeah but yeah besides yeah. So, that... aside from the toilets yeah yeah <laughs> not a lot to <laughs> i may have a whole separate episode that we just talked <laughs> about the toilets actually because there's a really great uh if for those of you out there want to want to get really deep with this um, <laughs> slavoj uh zizek the um the social critic uh, theorist um who's from slovenia um he's got this uh great video on youtube where he literally oh. gives like a talk you know about um the different styles of toilets in Germany, the United States, and uh, and Hung- and uh, and France, cool. and and um, and it basically what it says about the people, and it's so it's absolutely hilarious. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's also like he's actually being serious. Like he's he's doing actual critical social theory and stuff. That's <laughs> awesome. This. So you should look that up, Slavoj Zizek. Uh, okay. um, He's the one that's, uh, he's kind of a popular figure and he speaks with kind of a, you know, you know, you know he's like, he's got this kind of a, a, a speech impediment thing, you know, um, so he's kind mm-hmm. of known for that, um, but he's absolutely brilliant. Um, and so anyway, that's a, if you want to know more about toilets, there you have it. Cool. Um, well, Heather, um, thanks for joining me on this. This was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and, thank uh, you for having me. Just to remind listeners, if you popped in, you know, halfway through the discussion, this is yep, Heather Keegan, it. and mm-hmm. um, 
and uh, she is a fellow expatriate here in, um, in living in Budapest. Mm-hmm. And um, so this would be hopefully a, an ongoing series where every once in a while, maybe once a month or something like that, I'm going to just have a nice casual conversation with another person who has ended up in Budapest. Cool. Yeah, great. It's, it's, it's been really, really fun. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for, thank you for having me. All right. It's been my pleasure. Mm-hmm.